looking at all these mostly dead Spartans and I'm wondering, is Speedo Underpants in a cave really the wisest battle gear? Are most of you maybe dead because you went out to war dressed in what a five-year-old wears to cosplay Superman? The Oracle's words stand as a warning. Lena Headey is in Cersei Lannister in this narration. Zack Snyder did not direct this movie, but he co-wrote the screenplay. I imagine he wrote this thing in slow motion, and the movie just followed suit. This one beheading probably took up three pages of the screenplay. Also, let's just go ahead and add a hundred sins for that For Athens is a pile of stone and wood and cloth and dust. And human remains, and metal, and earth, and midichlorians. This is some of the most egregious and unnecessary nudity I've seen since Logan. Persian king Darius annoyed by the notion of Greek freedom, has come to Greece to bring us to heal. I have no f***ing clue what's going on. We started on Leonidas, dead at the end of the last movie, then her speech about him dying, wherein she casually drops something about ten years, but also clearly seems to blame the Persian king for that war that killed Leonidas. Now we're- is this happening now? Ten years went by and we're going to war again? Do I have that right? If you're gonna exposit so much movie, you could at least give the viewer their bearings. They attack before they can establish their war camp and supply their soldiers. Is this whole movie gonna be her talking over slow motion footage? Back in those days, human blood looked like CGI strawberry jelly. Agonizingly slow horse stampede! No matter how much of a badass you are or want to appear to be, taking off your helmet is not a good idea. Especially considering it just saved your life about four seconds ago. But whatever, you're a badass. This guy turns around and is so enamored with Xerxes, he probably looks at him for a good ten seconds before turning back around to see an arrow coming straight for him. Obviously, since everything is in slow motion, this could be a second for all I know, but that's why it looks so dumb when he gets hit by this thing. Guess I won't be needing this anymore! Thank God everyone in this battle just leaves this dude alone so he's able to do this. No. It was Darius's son, Xerxes, whose eyes had the stink of destiny about them. And Themistocles could see this stink of destiny in his eyes all the way from the beach. It was so stinky. Themistocles knew he should have killed that boy. Why didn't he? Was there some reason he didn't, other than to make this movie happen? Her ferocity bested only by her beauty. Her beauty matched only by her devotion to her king. So two things are actually better than her ferocity, then. I guess when the king is ailing, they turn the public throne room into a public bedroom, which seems awkward at best. In her, he had the perfect warrior protege that his son Xerxes would never be. You literally just spent the last scene telling me that letting Xerxes live would be the end of Themistocles. Also, are you telling me this guy survived long enough after getting hit by an arrow and sailing across the sea back home? Also, I guess they somehow tore his armor off in such a way that the arrow stayed lodged in his chest. How the f*** do you make that happen? Do not repeat your father's mistake. Don't openly stand on an attacking, shore-breaking boat with zero shields or armor, basically, right? Artemisia gathered the priests, wizards, and mystics from every corner of the Empire. They agreed that they needed to strip this guy naked, wrap him in gauze, dip him in ancient potions, have him walk the desert, and maybe, just maybe, he'd find a cave where he could jump into an evil pool and turn into a god. How a bunch of holy men, magicians, and shamans from around the world agreed on this is more of a miracle than this guy turning into a god. But as he emerged, no part of a human man that was Xerxes survived. Also, while in this pool, he was given all sorts of jewelry to wear, because that's what evil god transforming pools do. He was stripped. Cleansed. Glabrous and smooth. Glabrous? Glabrous? Sure, I can Google that but you just pulled a vocab word from God's butthole to try and sound smart. Then you casually tossed it among a series of blue-collar words. F you, movie, narrator, producer, and Bob. Xerxes was reborn a god. Because he walked into a pool? This movie explains everything except the sh you actually want to know about. Gah! Also, he's undefeatable and indestructible now, right? Unless Mesistopheles or whatever his name is does the same thing, the Greeks are doomed, right? That's not how blood works. So he's a god, but because she sort of caused it, she controls him? What? And as the god king stood before his people. God fucking damn it, why is she still talking? In the visage of a monster army over a million strong. Whoa, we skipped over a major detail here. How did Xerxes conjure up monsters for an army? Remember the battle that began this story? It was just a bunch of dudes. It's not like there were a bunch of battle-ready monsters all over the place. I imagine something like that takes time, money, and more importantly, existing monsters. This society clearly hasn't established the group therapy rules on the talking torch. Wait, it's what's for dinner. The shot that is supposed to be cool only gives us more time to examine how disappointed we are. Who is willing to die at our king's side? This movie makes it seem like Delios was the guy who recruited the 300 to fight against the Persians, but I clearly remember some Scarface dude who rounded up the men in the last movie. Unless, of course, you and Leonidas have already made a deal with Xerxes. What the f*** is happening? Is this movie 20 plus minutes of prequel before, or at some point, going modern? This is what Wikipedia says. It is a follow-up to the 2006 film 300, taking place before, during, and after the main events of that film. Because that makes sense. I mean, did the first movie even acknowledge any of this shit? This is no typical Greek city-state. This is Sparta. This movie strokes Sparta so much, I'm surprised the Mediterranean Sea didn't get pregnant. We are not interested in a united Greece. That is your dream, Themistocles, not ours. All I am concerned with is the preservation of Sparta. 
She doesn't even know what the Oracle is going to say yet, and she turns this guy down. This movie does nothing to explain why Sparta hates Athens so much they're unwilling to join forces. Now, yes, this is revisionist history, so that the romantic notion of 300 men fighting millions of Persians on their own can happen. But the reasons for this revisionist history are unsatisfactory. It's funny that you mock freedom here in your selfish isolation. Funnier still that you can say that with a straight face, considering the fake-ass CGI bullshit going on behind you. Apparently the Persians have offered the Spartans something they cannot refuse. And what is that? A beautiful death. I'm sorry, but this whole Spartan men want to die a beautiful death thing is completely overrated. It's doubtful that even the Sparta as shown in these movies puts a beautiful death over basic f***ing common sense. The director said, let's have your character eat an apple with a knife. It'll make you seem like even more of an asshole. You know, assholery aside, this is a really inconvenient way to eat an apple. I guess this guy fell on some sort of glass ceiling. Well, better to be a dead man above a glass ceiling than a living woman underneath it. That's what I always say. Decapa kissing. Also, just in case you didn't know the Eva Green character was the worst of the worst, here's this scene. I guess the next scene is her in bed with the head and getting angry that he never listens to her. Movie completely ignores the Mythbusters findings on projectiles shot through water cliche. 300 sequel, prequel, whatever takes a page from the Pirates of the Caribbean franchise, for better or worse. To was found near death by a Persian emissary. Obviously, it was someone we know from the previous movie. Guy that got kicked down a hole. He was much more than that. She was fed, clothed, and trained by the finest warriors of the Persian Empire. You know, by the guy who was so good at fighting, they sent him as a messenger in the first movie so he could die like a little bitch. <laughs> Why would she stop here? She just sliced open his leg and probably his femoral artery as well, killing him in the process. But now she stopped short. Did she forget until now that this guy saved her life and that this is a training session? Why do so many shots in this movie have hovering white particles in them? Gerard Butler only appears in this movie via shots from the first movie. He's not even credited. He probably got job like Crispin Glover on Back to the Future 2. Oh, sh Fastbender also got jobbed here like James Franco in Dawn of the Planet of the Apes. To attack a force of over a thousand ships with our meager force is suicide. Such is my plan. A plan which you should all know, since I told you we're sticking with the plan, which suggests we've already planned this out and you should know what's going on, even though for some reason you don't seem to know it. How is it even possible this asshole is just now sharpening his blade? Jesus, the battle is minutes away, asshole. My brothers, steady your heart. For it's been but five minutes since the last rousing speech in this movie, and by God, we will corner the market on rousing speeches. Also, no one on any of the other boats besides this one is being inspired right now. Why are all these soldiers shirtless in these movies? They wear helmets, but somehow haven't evolved to understand torsos are important to protect too. There's only one thing to make sure of when the fighting starts. What's that? Hey, dickface, I'm sure he's about to tell you. I mean, did they really need to give this guy a line here? They went out on the sea to do battle, but ended up in this three-circle configuration. And I'm no naval general, but this looks like a very goofy and ineffective battle formation. How is this f***ing 200-foot-tall wave aiding the Persian Navy's attack not also a tsunami the entire conquered world should be worried about right now? This is some interstellar f here. That wave is easily five Persian boat lengths tall. This wave should decimate all the Mediterranean civilizations completely. Attack! How are they supposed to attack? The ships are still separate and far apart, and your dudes have swords, not arrows. So is this command supposed to get them to jump in the water and start swinging, or what? This guy throws a spear, but are the Persians even shooting arrows right now? Yeah, we've seen a couple, but they aren't exactly peppering the Greeks with them. I mean, look at these assholes. What are they doing? Ram them! I know that this ship got the order to ram the Persian ship, but how did the other ship on the other side get this order? I know they have these flag-waving guys, but how do you communicate your order so quickly when your view is blocked? I love how that massive interstellar wave just disappears and is never spoken of again after this battle starts. Go through them! By the way, while the Greeks do all this ramming, where is the rest of the gigantic Persian fleet? This is the problem with action scenes like this. No sense of the overall battle, where everyone is, or what people plan to do. It's all noise and blood. Movie suggests these two can see each other. I'm bored with your failures, Bandari. That's apparently the name Zack Snyder now goes by, according to my brain. Who would have known a group of untrained men would do so well against such a considerable adversary? Whoa, wait a minute. These assholes were untrained? And yet they pulled off every single maneuver without a hitch? How long do you think we can hold them? I'll go on the count of your chiseled abs in this shot and say 12 hours. A dozen abs. I mean hours. He's rumored to have loosed the arrow that felled the great King Darius himself. So let's rehash that scene for people who suffer from memento. My disappointment is in these men. What a shrill character they created for Eva Green. She's as one-dimensional as it gets, untrusting that the audience will know how evil and unreasonable she is. Now she expects results from thin air, which makes her stupid, and not the type of villain that's going to be satisfying to watch die. This oar hitting the water feels like stock footage. And maybe it is, but I'm guessing it's not. But that this film's issues center mostly on an over-importance on the visual presentation and an under-importance on the story and characters. No! No. Don't lose sight of them! Wow, sure was lucky that when the Greeks came out to battle today, they had this fog to work with. What would the plan have been if there was no fog? Or did they plan for the fog? The Greeks are retreating. He's got him right where he wants him. Bashani is a fine tactician. I was speaking of Themistocles. 
Yes, you see, being a terrible person means I am excellent at the pronoun game. I refuse to believe, even in these ancient times, that both societies didn't have detailed maps of the waterways. This surprise motherfucker moment is some bullshit. Jesus Christ, how is this happening? Visibility aside, the sea and the land shouldn't be a mystery to any of these people at this point. Gotta say, I'm not a fan of this jumping off the cliff onto a boat to fight technique. How many people are gonna get injured or die trying this? Also, let's not forget that a lot of these guys are untrained men. Like, these assholes suddenly have the bravery to jump from this height and just start whooping ass. Well, won't be needing this anymore. As you expected, this battle scene is chopped up all to hell. God, people be spitting blood in this movie like there's no tomorrow. And every single wound spurts blood at the camera. To pay off that 3D release, I guess. Who puts a throne on a goddamn warship? Especially a throne this heavy and ornate. What are you doing here? Perfect time for this conversation, Dad. We just saw this guy slice through asshole after asshole, but I guess because Themistocles is awesome, he gets away with a simple kick and instantly starts winning. Why is it so much to ask for victory? Is Gorgo still telling this story to the Spartans? Is that still a thing? Does she also include all the dialogue from Artemisia? How does she know all that? But most of all, fear is freedom! And other rejected lines from Braveheart. Holy sh what is up with that moon? Why isn't the sea going absolutely back crazy right now? Is it about to collide with the Earth? I mean, Jesus Christ, that moon is annoying enough, I'm gonna add another sin for it. F that moon. Fear the Greek fighting man. Themistocles gives another speech only 10% of his army can hear. So begins many, many chances for Artemisia to just dispose of Themistocles right now. The character we've been presented gives zero f so why she decides to let him live is amazingly stupid. Themistocles agrees to a late night boat meeting with the Persian queen and goes without bodyguards and somehow he's not killed immediately. I offer you a chance to avoid such misery and join me. Artemisia gives this the good old college try, but seriously, killing this dude right now is the best thing possible. This part of the movie takes up a good eight minutes of runtime and makes no sense whatsoever. So, Themistocles and Artemisia have some weird sex, which, considering the Eva Green factor, is both awesome and predictable. After watching The Dreamers and Dark Shadows, I think it's in her contract to do uncomfortable sex scenes. <laughs> These masked guard guys would be amazing at cinema sins. Jesus Christ, this sex scene has been going on for over a full minute. We get it! Join me. No. I would have removed 50 sins if he said yes. Be quick with your sword. You'll not have your death tonight. Why? F***ing why? It's pretty obvious that Artemisia thinks this dude is the reason why the Greeks are winning, and she's super evil. So why the mercy now? Why would she give a sh Hey guys, just want to let you know if Artemisia, but don't worry, I'm still on your side. So let us commence with the singing of Summer Nights from Greece. No, not Greece, but Greece. I'll explain later. The next time that we face her, she's going to bring all of hell with her. It's somehow going to be more hell than she has brought before. Don't ask me why she didn't bring it in the last two battles. We could also luck out with a hurricane that only attacks her ships, but I asked the fog from the last battle and he said it's not likely. Archers! Archers, no! Since when did you assholes get archers? In the first battle, you all threw spears. You didn't think archers might be handy? Okay, this dude spears one of the Persians with all the oil on his armor that Artemisia is going to set ablaze with arrows later. But this is one dude. There are about 10 to 15 dudes in the water who all reach the boat. So where the f*** did they go? There's no one other than Silius here, so why haven't the oil dudes overtaken this boat? Oh yeah, I remember that flashback of her training. She's a badass, even though she's yet to do anything present day that's demonstrated that. <laughs> Themistocles survives this. Loch Ness monster of sorts ex machina, what the fuckery? Oh, multiple sea beasts, and they're fighting each other, just like what's happening up top. Remind me again how this makes sense or ties in or is important at all. How many men would have been saved if Themistocles had killed that boy? It sounds like to me that it doesn't matter if he killed that boy. The story so far is that Artemisia is the true evil in this story, and she would have found a way to manipulate a whole bunch of people to start this war anyway. Also, this guy got hit by three goddamn arrows and was then slung into the sea during a major explosion. How is he even the slightest bit alive? I guess this is after the end of the first movie, but I'm honestly not sure. This sequel has jumped time periods so damn much I don't care anymore, and this is just some CGI beach of bodies I don't connect with at all. Let my army witness the great warriors of Sparta. Of course it's time for another speech. By the way, I can't believe this is based on an unpublished Frank Miller graphic novel called Xerxes, because it's clearly Artemisia the movie. Leonidas was betrayed by a hunchback. Tom Hulse? The Spartans have been slaughtered. Also, he killed like a million Persians, but that's not important to the story. I'm here to speak to you, Queen. A warning, Athenian. You may not receive a warm welcome. Thank you very much, character from the last movie who was pointless in this movie. Have I not given enough for your dream of a united Greece? Um, has she given, like, anything? The last time these two met, all she did was tell him to go fuck yourself, essentially. So the answer is no, then. Have I not given enough for your ambitions, Themistocles? Sorry to sin this again, but no? Is there a scene missing where she gave him something? Themistocles is dead. He is alive! I have seen him myself. Absolutely no burns, despite being engulfed in flames. Can you believe that You failed us all. This is your fault, Themistocles. You are all right. 
I'm conceding this so that I can provide you all with a fantastic speech. Have you guys ever heard one of my speeches? I take your immediate non-answer as a no, so here goes. A story that will be told for a thousand years. We'll tell this story for a thousand years, or else the rights go back to Marvel somehow. Without Artemisia's command, the Persian Navy is nothing. Essentially, this mission is going to be like finding the alien queen, killing her, and ending the war by default. One thing that's been bothering me. After Leonidas destroyed a million billion Persians, and Themistocles destroyed another large group of ships, how the f*** do the Persians still have this many boats and men? Today I want to feel Themistocles' throat beneath my boots. Isn't that a little bit greedy? You've already felt his penis in your vagina. Who decides their spinal column needs armor? Who says, yes, my lower lumbar must be protected by gold-encrusted spiky things? Got a question. Who decides how the battle will start? This is like the fourth open sea battle in this movie, and I can't figure out how anyone decides how the attack will occur. Like, in this case, why do the Persians even allow the boat to make it this far? Why aren't archers unleashing a million arrows in their direction? The movie goes out of its way to make the finale confusing, and I have no idea who's doing what here, but I guess... yay? Like, how aren't all the people who deliver the splatter and kill shot not covered in blood in this movie? Good luck steering a horse through boat wreckage and shit, dude. I mean, shit. You must have put this horse through some serious immersion therapy to achieve this kind of bravery. Riding a horse across fiery ship debris to face your enemy feels like a video game ending. <laughs> this f***ing horse is magic! And I won't be needing this anymore. Movie rips off the both of them have the other by the neck cliche from a dozen previous movies. I would rather die a free man than as a slave. Can you just kill her already? It begins as a whisper. Sure, while these two are at each other's throats, there's definitely time for another speech. A wind, my brothers of sacrifice. Damn, that was a long-ass story she just told these dudes on this boat. You know, a handful of these guys are like, geez, did we even need to hear about Artemisia and Themistocles having sex that one time? God damn, does Persia have a Commodore 64 where they run a simple program that spits out random soldiers ad infinitum? I don't doubt for one minute that Gorgo is a badass, but do women ever train in the Sparta we've been shown? Isn't this a man's world? Remember, in 300, she tells the messenger that women are tough because they're the only ones who could give birth to the strong men of Sparta. But I don't remember her ever picking up a sword and learning how to use it like she's the second coming of Leonidas. Glabrous. Are you not entertained? The skipper has yet to put a single crab on board. I want you to know I understand. Even though we're enemies, you and I, I understand the fury that drives you. I was there that day when Sir Gregor crushed your lover's head. The Baffled King composing Hallelujah. It's not heaven. It's a new world. The future is gold. Shadow. Always shall be your friend. <laughs>